Here on BBC Radio 4 now, after a career break, the award-winning Impressions Show is back. Dead Ringers. BBC Radio 4, I'm Neil Nunes. If my voice were any lower, it would only be heard by whales. <laughs> that earthquake in Cornwall last year, that was me. I coughed. Before I speak, everything in the studio has to be nailed down. Even Evan Davis. Especially Evan Davis. He's so scared of my voice, he's run away to Newsnight. Davis, I'll be watching you along with the 12 other viewers. <laughs> You're listening to Today with John Humphreys and Jim Nocte. Coming up in the next half hour, Britain confirms the toughest ever sanctions <laughs> against Putin's cronies as Roman Abramovich discovers he's now owner of Accrington Stanley. <laughs> Time now for sport with Gary Richardson. Well, these Commonwealth games... We'll have to leave it there, Gary, as we don't really like sport. <laughs> Coming up after seven, we'll be discussing assisted dying with Toby Young and Yasmin Alibaya brown So that's a big yes from me. <laughs> but first, Ed Miliband has finally admitted he's very weird indeed. <laughs> he joins me now. Yes, that's right. It's time for me to come out the closet. <laughs> and scare the children. <laughs> to say that I am weird and I'm proud. I want to be the first Prime Minister who can pull his bottom lip over his head <laughs> and decide every Doctor Who episode in order. Fine, I'll just put my hand a little nearer to this button. Jim, we don't press the button anymore. I promise not to, John. It's just a placebo. Now, <laughs> Mr Miliband, you've also unveiled plans that... Should you become Prime Minister, you will go round the country answering questions from the public. How will you resist resorting to rambling, disjointed soundbites? Well, Jim, I leave disjointed soundbites to other people. But let me say this. Look, the government is in a race to the bottom, and that is a status quo I do not accept. There is a squeeze middle out there, sandwiched by debt and the cost of living. And when I go on the doorstep, I find that people up and down the country say to me, look, we need a fair shot, and I believe passionately that I listen to them. <laughs> You didn't answer my question at all. Well, Jim, I leave not answering questions to other people. But let me just say this. I listen to status quo, and that's not acceptable. This government is in a race to squeeze my bottom. And I believe passionately that people need to get a fair shot at me when I eat a doorstep sandwich. Look, can you answer the question, you weirdo? Just answer it, I beg you. Well, Jim, I leave begging to other people. But let me just say this. The government is in a race to shoot status quo before they go out on the doorstep. <laughs> status quo go rocking all over the world, and they tell you there is a race to go down, down, deeper and down. <laughs> Please, for the love of God, make him stop! Well, Jim, I leave stopping to other people. <laughs> Instead, what we say is whatever you want, whatever you like, whatever you say, you pay your money, you take your choice. <laughs> you pressed the button, didn't you, Jim? He made me. In the olden days, or some time around that, there was a disease that was sort of pretty bad. And it was carried on the back of some big mice, maybe, or rats, and loads of people were really poorly and some had a bit of dicky belly. That was William Hague being vague about the plague. <laughs> As part of the BBC's new season, we thought of the title first. I'm Brendan Foster. If I say it's Mer Farrah, it's Mer Farrah. Live with it. Well, you join us here at Hampden Park for one of the most anticipated events of these entire Commonwealth Games. It's the individual time trial for presenters to see how long they can go without mentioning the London Olympics. <laughs> and Michael Johnson, this is a seriously tough event. Yes, it really is, Brandon, because everybody here... <laughs> they are absolutely desperate to piggyback on the success of the London Olympics. Well, uh, first up, it's Gabby Logan. 
So we're going over now to the women's heptathlon, which unfortunately doesn't feature Jessica Ennis-Hill, one of the stars of the London Olympics, because she... Oh, so 6.42 seconds there, pretty much the average period between mentions of the London Olympics on the BBC. Next, it's Claire Balding. Yes, and I don't like Balding's chances here because if she can't talk about the London Olympics, she's going to have to shout the word horse over and over again. <laughs> Marvellous. It's just like the London Olympics. Horse! Horse! 1.9 seconds for Claire Balding. Not a good time, but still a personal best. <laughs> now it's the home favourite, Hazel Irvine. Let's show you some action now from the men's gymnastics. An event I'm sure you'll know all about from the Lo Lo um, from the Lundis pull-out guide that they produced. Nicely done. Lewis Smith will be hoping to go one better than he did at the, Lon the Lon Lonny Donegan Karaoke Championship, <laughs> where he finished second. Oh, she's done it. Magnificent. It's a new BBC sport record, and the crowd here have gone absolutely berserk. We haven't seen scenes like this since the London Olympic... Oh, bugger. <laughs> Coming up next, as part of the BBC season, we thought of the title first, we go live to the Bronx. Uh, excuse me, love, uh, I couldn't help but noticing you puffing on that crack pipe. That'll make you feel a bit iffy. Uh, try one of these instead. It's a chorley cake. That'll sort you right out. <laughs> that was Victoria Wood doing good in the hood. <laughs> Next on Radio 4, as part of the BBC's Nigel Farage appears on everything season, <laughs> Gardener's Question Time. Hello, I'm Eric Robson, for those who find Alan Titchmarsh a bit too rock and roll. <laughs> Welcome to Gardener's Question Time, the show where the audience laugh without really understanding the joke. <laughs> Bunny Guinness. So I said to him, you might as well call it Primula Very Vulgaris. <laughs> <laughs> First question, please. Yes, you, madam. Oh, uh, excuse me, Mr Farage. I don't want to cause a fuss, but um, I've got spindly rhubarb. No, no, no. Look, I am Nigel Farage. <laughs> Hear me roar. Let's talk about the real issue here. The blatant press agenda against UKIP. I'm sick of being asked all these negative questions. Why don't you ask about our support for British workers, our support for weekly bin collections, or our support for my vibrant mustard chinos? <laughs> Why don't you ask about my marvellous head of British hair, or my Union Jack boxer shorts, or my ability to drink 15 pints and still do the Fandango? Why don't you ask me about the time I gave a whip at the kiss of life, or the time I ate a hundredweight of Lancashire hot pot, or the time I wrestled a beef eater for charity in a phone box, nude as the day I was born? <laughs> I am Nigel Farage. Don't stop me now. I'm having such a good time. I'm having a ball. <laughs> But, um, what about my spindly rhubarb? Ah, just water it more. <laughs> Join us next week on Gardener's Question Time, where well, the answer to everything is, as always, just water it more. <laughs> you know, one of the great, unfathomable wonders of the universe <laughs> is the way that one sock always goes missing. <laughs> An unbreakably fixed law of physics. Not for me. I've taken security measures. That was Brian Cox locks his socks in a box. <laughs> Hello, I'm Michael Portillo, the only television presenter to be made entirely of leather. <laughs> and welcome to another thrilling episode of Great British Railway Journeys, where I travel the length and breadth of Britain, yet somehow never have to use a rail replacement service. <laughs> this week, I'm going from London to somewhere that isn't London. <laughs> it could be anywhere. I don't really care. I only do this show because it gets me far, far away from Diane Abbott. <laughs> As the train winds through the stunning rolling hills, I'm struck by the thought that the most beautiful thing about this view is not the verdant fields, not the church spires, it's the fact that Diane Abbott is hundreds of miles away, <laughs> not talking to me. Michael! Oh, Lord, what are you doing here? Well, Michael, I'm taking a little break from my important job of mentioning the people of Hackney in every sentence. <laughs> 
to find out where this train is going and how that might affect the people of Hackney. <laughs> now I'm going to sit far too close to you on this little seat. Diane, this is great, but, but I am actually filming. You? <laughs> filming? Well, without me and Andrew? Well, who'd, who'd watch that? Certainly not the people of Hackney. <laughs> This is great. The old team back together again. Don't tell me Andrew Neal's bought a ticket too. No, of course not. Good afternoon. This is your driver, Andrew Neal. <laughs> well, I've never driven a train before. I'm going to do it just like I present this week. Get half a pint of whiskey, put some whimsy on auto cue, and then bluff my way through. <laughs> Oh, God. Don't worry, Michael. I taught him everything I know about driving trains. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it seems I've ploughed into a signal box. So we might be stuck here for the foreseeable future. To keep you entertained, me, Diane and Michael will now present a five-hour version of this week. Oh, good. That will be extremely gratifying for the people of Hackney. <laughs> And now on ITV, the return of Downton Abbey. Once more, we're invited into the world of inherited wealth, lavish parties and grand country estates of Julian Fellows. Oh, blast. I've lost all the family fortune investing in something damned idiotic. Oh, Robert. Does this mean we're ruined? Boop, boop, be doo. <laughs> oh, Isabel, what shall we do? Well, we shall be all right, Cora. It's the poor people below stairs I'm concerned about. Well, quite, my dear. I saw a poor wretched man on the street the other day with his five starving children. He asked me for change. I said, change comes from within. Boom! Still got it. Everyone a zinger. Oh, calm down, everyone. You know we start every new decade with Downton facing ruin. Then something always turns up. Oh, Robert, look. A donkey has wandered into the room with hundreds of fifty-shilling notes pinned to it. We're saved. boo boo be doo <laughs> Can anyone else hear a low, droning hum? Yes, I'm afraid that's Lady Mary. We got so sick of her bleating, we stuck her in the cupboard. Pain stalks my very existence. My heart broken and shattered in two. The grey cloud permanently hanging over me. Must remind Carson to get a lock for that. <laughs> Lord Grantham, the 1960s are here. Already? I'm afraid so. Uh, you know how this show races through the decades. Show the 1960s into the open plan kitchen diner and lay out some tea on the formica. Lord Fellows will be weaving them into some rudimentary plot after luncheon. Very good, sir. Or should I say, groovy man. <laughs> Robert, I'm a feminist now. I've burnt my bra. Boo boo be doo. <laughs> oh dear, Cora, you really should have taken it off first. Lord Grantham, I must see you immediately. I've been drafted. I'm off to fight in Vietnam, or I might go to Woodstock. The telegram was a little unspecific. <laughs> what a terrible waste of people's lives. Yes, Robert. War is always. No, not very... the war. Woodstock. <laughs> and those endless ITV ad breaks. Oh, here comes Winston's giant floating head. Lost all the rent money? Wife left you. Gambling debts piling up? Don't worry. We've got live in-play odds that the next ad's going to be them Wonga puppies. <laughs> They're going to sort you right out. How ghastly. Now, what was I saying? Oh, yes, Woodstock. I'm concerned you're not keeping up, Robert. It was the 1960s before the ad break. It's the 1970s now. Lord Grantham, there's a pop group here. The Sex Pistols. They want to smash the established order and eventually sell some butter. <laughs> Just show them into the study and gobbon them on their way out, Carson. <laughs> oh, damn, the lights have gone off. That'll be the three-day week. I wonder how the unions manage a three-day week. That's nearly twice what they usually work. Boom! Pow! Everyone a zinger, I'm here all week. Try the venison with quail's egg and a balutine of duck. <laughs> I'm back from fighting in Vietnam, and I'm off to fight in the Civil War in Sorry, Lever Tom, there's no time for long-drawn goodbyes. Can't you see Cora's so terribly unwell? Oh, Robert, I'm dying. 
Damn and blast it. Lord Grantham, the 1980s are here. Ah, that would explain why Isabel's shoulders have swollen. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. I'll start by leaving some bread out, if you stop honking. That was Fiona Bruce makes a truce with a goose. Good afternoon, working title. Oh, hello there, yeah, um, working title, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, hi there, it's, uh, it's Idris Elba calling. Sorry about the call out of the blue. Um, I just had an idea uh, and I just felt I had to call and, and just put it down. It struck me quite profoundly, actually, but um, I'm just thinking it might be time to make uh, Rainbow the movie. And um, <laughs> I just wonder what you thought about that, you know? Um, I wouldn't be the best person to talk to. Um, if you want to, I just um, basically, if you go through your agent towards us, yeah, that'd be the yeah. easiest to do. I'm probably thinking of this, I'd probably take on the role of Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the linchpin really deliver the opening text. Um, for Bungle, uh, you know, Bungle's such a tenacious, curious character. I'm, I'm, I think probably we would go down the John Goodman route, Jack Black. Um, George the Pink Hippo, I think maybe we could have some surprising casting with that. Maybe Gary Oldman or Edward Norton. I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, as I said, I'm, not, I'm just a receptionist here, so yeah. <laughs> I have no clue. Who do you think to play Zippy? Ross Kemp? <laughs> uh, yeah, that would work. I, th- I think that would. I, I think that would. He is tenacious, he is arrogant, and um, Ross Kemp, I think, would just be the right sort of shape. Mm. <laughs> Good. Uh, I've spoken to the members of Kasabian. Um, they're happy to be Rod, Jane and Freddie. That's fine, it's just a formality. Um, yeah. So I'll play Jeffrey. I'll, I'll just do the opening text, you know, up above the streets and houses. Rainbow climbing high. <laughs> you can see it smiling over the sky. You know, just, I, I'm borrowing a bit from Luther, uh, admittedly, there. Um, but I think that will set me up to singing Wheels on the Bus, and, um, and then I think we're in. Great. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for just being so open to it. All right, buddy. And this is going to really send me on my way to depose Ray Winston and I will get on the Bet365 adverts. Have a bang on it. (laughs) From the makers of X-Men comes the British motion picture event of the year. Dame Judi Dench. You need to realise who you're dealing with here. (laughs) Sir Ian McKellen. You picked the wrong people to mess with. (laughs) Sir Patrick Stewart. We will not let this stand. (laughs) Sir Alan Bennett. You're a very shouty movie trailer man. (laughs) Reminds me of a fishmonger in Buxton. (laughs) Who once overcharged me Auntie Pauline for some drenched haddock. (laughs) They are the National Treasures. And this summer, they must twinkle like they've never twinkled before. The new one is here. We must induct her into the fold. Come forth. Come forth, my dear. Come forth, Olivia Coleman. (laughs) Are you ready to join us? It's very kind of you. Uh, But are you sure about this? Uh, Seems a lot of fuss. We have been watching you for a long time. I first saw you in hay fever in rep in Barnstable in 1997. That self-deprecating charm will serve you well, Olivia. I I, I might just leave it. Silence. You are the chosen one, Coleman. (laughs) The one who will replace Thora Heard. (laughs) The greatest of us will lead us into the battle of all battles to erase Garibaldo from the timeline. (laughs) Take hold of this sacred path, sir, handed down through the generations. <laughs> Become one of us. But, but I, I'm not. I, I can't. I... Oh, yes, you can, Olivia. You can. You're ready. <laughs> Thora, but you... Dead? Oh, yes, I am, love. But that never stopped Alec Guinness with his force thing, did it? And it won't stop me. I will always live on in your heart and most days on Radio 4 Extra. (laughs) Always at your side, guiding you towards the righteous path 
on my heavenly chariot. Stairlift. Don't spoil the magic, love. <laughs> Sorry. You must join them on their sacred quest to be lovely. Do not fight your destiny. Say it, Olivia. Say the words. I am a national treasure. Smashing. All oh, right, who fancies a cuppa? I've got Earl Grey, Darjeeling, and does anybody fancy a nice balm cake? <laughs> Hello, I'm Michael Portillo, unfortunately, and welcome <laughs> to another episode of Great British Railway Journeys. Slight change from the norm this week. I'm not going by rail, and I'm leaving Britain. I'm going to the Arctic Circle. Desolate, cold, barren. Here, more than ever, one can be sure Diane Abbott will be nowhere <laughs> to be... Michael, Michael, hi! Oh, God. <laughs> Diane, what are you doing in the Arctic? Well, Michael, I was just coming back from an episode of Celebrity Come Dine With Me, and the taxi must have gotten lost. This is wonderful. It's just like Hackney. <laughs> but with snow instead of betting shots. <sighs> well, at least Andrew's not here as well. Hello, Michael. Lovely weather. Oh, God. Well, since we're all here, I suggest we make a sofa out of some snow and do this week on ice. For me, it is simply a stupid bastard horse donkey. That was Brian Sewell being cruel about a mule. <laughs> You're watching E4. How old are you? <laughs> Now it's time for our latest structured reality show. In a desperate attempt to make politics relevant to teenagers, they're posh, they're privileged, and their personal lives are complicated. It's made in Westminster. Yeah, hey, like George, you know, thank you so much for agreeing to see me. Yeah, hey, Nick, no problem, bro. How's my boy? Basically, George, right? The, the reason why I've come to see you today is because I wanted to have a conversation between us because I've been hearing these rumours that you've basically been briefing behind my back. I'm hashtag furious. <laughs> Seriously? I cannot believe you just accused me of that. Are you, like, actually serious, though? <laughs> Listen, man, I just can't believe you disrespect me like this. Like with our history, are you my bro? Are you my bro, though? I need to know if you're my bro. <laughs> Uh, I can 100% confirm that I am indeed your bro, but like, I have literally no idea what you're talking about. I just, like, don't get it. This is like the time we were on Question Time and you, like, totally disrespected me in front of Tony Robinson. Like, I thought we weren't going to talk about what happened in Dimbleby's hot tub. Like, has someone been stirring up stuff about me? Is this like William Hague slagging me off just because I trashed his kitchen, like, literally once? No. No. Dave told me that Danny saw you talking to Dimbleby when you knew that I would be on the lads' weekend in Brussels, sorting out North Sea fishing policy with Vince. What? Is it back on with you and Vince? Oh, it's just, like, really complicated, OK? <laughs> I swear I didn't brief against you. That's just typical David, yeah? Stirring up shit because he wants attention now that Boris is sniffing about. <laughs> well, is Boris back? Hashtag legit. <laughs> yeah, totes legit. Like, there goes all the totty. The thing is, I just don't like drama. No, me neither, mate. Like, I hate drama. I just keep out of it. I, like, say it like I see it. That's just the way I am. <laughs> well, bro, I haven't been completely honest, mate. It wasn't Vince I was meeting behind Dave's back at the North Sea Forum in Brussels. It was basically Ed. Ed wants me to leave Dave for him, and I just don't hashtag know what to do. <laughs> well, like, you know, if we're being honest, then there's something you need to know. It's like Dave's been having the exact same chat with Nigel, yeah? <laughs> yeah? He's been, like, sneaking off to pubs and everything. <laughs> to meet him behind everyone's back. It, it's total cringe box set, you know? <laughs> yeah? Don't cry, mate. It's not worth it. <laughs> no, no I, I'm not. Why do I always fall for the bad guys? Next week on Made in Westminster... Hi, I'm Esther McVeigh. I'm new in town. Is this seat taken? Only by you, baby cakes. Whoa. Welcome to Westminster, honk honk. Ah, ah. <laughs> Hello. I'm Michael Portillo. And welcome to a very special episode of Great British Railway Journeys. Live from Mars. <laughs> 
That's right, I've decided there is nowhere on the planet that I can fully escape the clutches of Diane Abbott and Andrew Neal. And what a beautiful sight. The Martian horizon, nothing for as far as the eye can see. Just rocks, stones, and a sofa, and an armchair. No, no, it's not possible. But Michael, the people of Hackney love me so much that they wanted me to go to Mars permanently. <laughs> How? How are you surviving here? There's no atmosphere. I know, it's just like our show. <laughs> Take a seat, Michael. You're just in time for us to discuss the Newark by-election for the next 50 years. <laughs> oh, hello, you little fella. How is you doing? You look very charming with your tiny paws and your squinty eyes. <laughs> What did you just say about me solo career? <laughs> Who do you think you are? You're a nobody. Check that, you velvety bastard. <laughs> that was Cheryl Cole kicks a mole down a hole. You've been listening to Dead Ringers. It was performed by John Culshaw, Jan Ravens, Lewis MacLeod, Deborah Stevenson and Duncan Wisby. It was written by Tom Jameson and Nev Fountain, Ed Emston, Jack Bernhardt, Tom Coles, John Culshaw, Bill Dare, Lawrence Howarth and Gronny Maguire. The producer was Bill Dare. <laughs>